The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ankit Mohan. I'm a postdoc with Ramesh, and I'm sorry he's not here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking briefly about what's called epsilon photography or film-like photography. It's actually how can we improve film-like photography. And I'm not sure what part, like some of this might be very straightforward and obvious to many of you. So if it seems like I'm going to slow, please let me know. Or if you want more detail on any of these topics, again, stop me and ask a question. So before we can try to improve film-like photography, we should understand what I mean by film-like photography. And this is basically what's been the camera obsc obscura model, where you have a pinhole or a center of projection, and you have rays of light that goes through that point and form an image on the sensor or a film plane. Uh, so what you see over here is, on the left, this is traditionally how you draw an optic ray diagram. You have the object or the scene on the left, and rays always travel from left to right. And there are people who do hardcore optics who can get really annoyed if you don't follow this model. So it's always a good thing to go from left to right. Uh, so you have a scene on the left. You have a center of projection, which is a pinhole in this case. What I haven't shown here is basically you can imagine a box that's surrounding the the, pin, the center of projection and the sensor and only a single point allows light to go through. What this gives us is a single ray from every point in the scene is allowed to go through the camera and forms an image on the sensor. Now, most objects around us are actually diffuse. What that means is, uh, the, technically it's called Lambertian. What that means is the rays, when you have an incident light coming on an object, it reflects light in all directions and most objects are diffuse in that all the rays that come out of a point on the object have roughly the same intensity. Uh, whereas the other case would be a specular object which reflects light in primarily one direction and not in all directions. So because most objects are diffuse, uh, when you have a pinhole camera taking a, a photograph, it looks very similar to what it appears to the eye. So it, ca it captures most of the information coming from the scene. Now, what a lens does is slightly different, is that it actually integrates over an angular extent. So in this case over here, uh, you have rays coming from a point in the scene, but not just one single ray uh, gets imaged on the sensor, but you have a whole cone of rays that get imaged on the sensor. So in this case, all the rays coming from a point in the scene that go through the lens aperture get focused onto the sensor plane. And this is basically how a lens works and how a camera, a modern camera works. Now, again, this is very straightforward stuff that uh, a lens obeys certain properties uh, in that the ratio of the distances has, they obey certain properties. And this, what this basically tells us, and I'm going to skip over some of this stuff, is this is, I think, the most important thing where, where if you have a lens, then only one plane in the scene gets imaged onto the sensor exactly. And if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between which scene is going to get imaged based on the focal length and the distance between the uh, lens and the sensor. This was not the case if it were a pinhole. In the case of a pinhole, everything appears in focus and you have what's called an infinite depth of field. So unlike a pinhole camera, a uh, camera with a finite aperture lens actually has a finite depth of field. Now, depth of field has an interesting definition. If you look it up in Wikipedia, it, it's, uh, it, in the case of film-based photography, it was defined at, as when you take a picture of a scene and you print the picture at a certain, resolu at a certain size paper and then a uh, standard human observer stands uh, some finite distance from it, can he or she tell the difference between two points, whether it's one is in focus or not in focus. So uh, based on that and certain perceptual tests that they did, they came up with this definition of how far you can get from the uh, point plane that's going to be in perfect focus and still 
give the appearance to a viewer that the plane is in focus. So what in this in the case of the digital camera, what it roughly translates to is that when you go away from the plane of focus, you are going to get uh, if you look over here, you're not rays are not going to focus to a point, but they're going to create a disk-like blur. And if the size of this disk-like blur is smaller than the size of a pixel, usually you cannot tell the difference between whether it's in focus or out of focus. So there is this finite region around a plane of focus that's called the depth of focus. And uh, it's actually, it's not symmetric. It's usually greater behind the plane of focus and smaller in front. And there's a corresponding uh, depth of field on the sensor side. So are there any questions about that? Uh, is this obvious stuff? What, uh, what's interesting is that the size of this depth of field depends on the size of the aperture. So in the case when we had a pinhole where our aperture size was infinitely small, the size of the depth of field is infinitely large, so everything is in focus. But as we increase the aperture size, like you can see from here, we went up here, you can, uh, the corresponding size, because these cone forms a much larger cone angle, the region in which um, the size of the blur would still be smaller than a pixel it becomes smaller and you have a much shallower depth of field. So this is something that photographers often use when they take pictures like portraits or macro photography is they try to open the aperture or keep the aperture as wide as possible and that results in a very shallow depth of field. So only the plane of interest is in focus anything behind and in front of it appears like a blur, uh, has a nice blurry appearance. Uh, on the other hand, if you're doing something like landscape photography, you want the tree that's 10 meters from you to be in sharp focus and also a mountain that's five kilometers away to be in sharp focus. So usually people use a smaller aperture size in order to get everything in focus. So we'll come back to this a little later when I talk about how you can computationally modify the depth of field and uh, things like that, but in general, it depends on the application. Uh, the application dictates what kind of depth of field you need, and most cameras give the photographer an opportunity to set the aperture size, which sets the depth of field. So, because there is only a, a single plane in the scene, which is actually in sharp focus, if you use a camera that does not have a pinhole aperture, which is most cameras you need to be able to select which plane you want to focus on, and that's usually done these days using autofocus. Uh, the cameras use different techniques for autofocus. The most common one these days in SLR cameras is this phase-based autofocus, which is this really interesting technique that I think was first proposed by Minolta way back in the late 70s. And what they essentially do is they form two separate images from the different... So, this, this is, I think, directly from the pattern. Uh, this is the main aperture of the main lens. And what they essentially do is create a range finder where the baseline is equal to the diameter of the lens aperture. What that means is essentially doing stereo or creating one image from one uh, corner of the lens and another image from the other corner of the lens and looking at those two images. If the scene is in focus, those two images are going to be exactly the same. If it's not in focus, there's going to be a phase mismatch. And by observing the phase mismatch, they can, uh, you can determine which direction the lens needs to move in and by how much. So it's a single shot focusing technique where by just getting this one reading, you can move the lens in the right direction and get an in focus scene. And this is usually very fast because you don't have to constantly keep searching and uh, the downside is that it, you need the special hardware in your camera and you, most SLR cameras have this kind of a hardware in them. Uh, another technique that most point and shoot compact cameras use is contrast based autofocus where uh, since you have a live view uh, coming from the, from the sensor directly, uh, you can look at one frame and you can try to maximize the contrast and uh, move the lens back and forth until you get the maximum contrast. And since you don't get an estimation of the phase like the previous case, you can, it's not a single shot operation. You have to usually search through the span of the, of the focus settings and find out which one has a maximum contrast and stop over there. That's where it's in focus. And it's usually slower than the previous case, but you don't need dedicated hardware in order to do this. And 
most compact camera sensors. Another technique that some of the older film-based compact cameras used was using uh, ultrasound or infrared-based uh, uh, estimation of how far a scene is. Uh, and it's, uh, it's something that's not very prevalent anymore. It's also not very accurate. Another technique that I don't mention here is what's called a rangefinder camera, and usually that's a separate unit from the main camera. The difference here is that this lens, the autofocus occurs through the lens. Uh, so it's what gets on the image plane is what's used to determine whether it's in focus or not in both these cases. In the case of a rangefinder camera, there is a separate unit which uh, basically does this shifting and trying to find when it's aligned, and it's usually done manually rather than automatically. Uh, I think the important point over here is that there's, there's lots of work that's gone on even before computational photography came into its being and in the area of trying to find very quickly and eff uh, effectively and repeatedly set the focus automatically on a camera, and uh, there's lots of engineering that's got into that. So focus was the first thing that a camera needs to worry about when it tries to take a picture. The second thing is what, what's called exposure. And what I'm trying to show over here is that the brightness of something that's uh, daylight versus something that's, something that's dark is widely different. And you have just 0 to 255, 8 bits, or at most 12 bits or 14 bits to work with in order to compress all of that information in there. And usually this span or the dynamic range does not, cannot go to more than uh, two or three or four uh, decades at most. And so what needs to be done is you need to de decide what exposure to use on a camera. And so this is uh, a scene that was underexposed versus overexposed. Overexposure means you let too much light into the camera versus underexposure if there wasn't enough light and the scene was, the image was dark. So exposure itself is, it comprises of these three things. One is the aperture size. The larger the aperture size, more the light coming in, and uh, the brighter the image is going to be. The shutter speed, how long you keep the shutter open for. If you keep it open for longer, you get more light in, and this, the image is brighter. And the film sensitivity, the light coming in, how many, uh, in the case of uh, film, how much, how much chemical can it translate, can it change or chemically modify. In the case of your... Um, digital sensor, it's the digital, uh, it's the analog to ADC converter gain is what is set by the ISO. So these three things sort of together determine what the exposure should be on your camera. So if you have set a certain shutter speed, you need to determine what the corresponding aperture size and the film sensitivity should be in order before you can take a picture. And once again, older cameras did required you to do this manually. Usually you would have film which was of a certain sensitivity and you set an ISO 100 uh, on it. You would select the aperture size and then you would have to, based on some sort of uh, rule of thumb or using an exposure meter, you would determine what the shutter speed should be. Uh, so this was drastically changed by Nikon in, I think, mid or late 80s where they proposed this Nikon matrix metering uh, scheme. And the idea over here is, so this is what the SLR camera looks like. You have the main lens, you have a mirror, the film plane is back here, the light coming in gets reflected up here into the pentaprism, and inside the pentaprism it bends twice and it goes through the viewfinder into the viewer's eyes. But what happens here is another small mirror reflects it up to the top where there are, there are these, they, they place these five I think there are five different zones, and they had a light meter at each of these zones, which was basically uh, capturing how many how, mu how many photons are coming in at that zone. So even before the picture is taken, the camera knows how bright the scene is, and based on that, and based on some heuristics that they came up with, uh, they determined what the correct exposure should be for the given photo. And this was supposed to be a very revolutionary technique back then, and it gave it. It did away with all the various rules of thumb that people had come up with before this in order to estimate a good exposure. And this is what led to the uh, change where, where you can just, the auto mode on a camera, you can just press the shutter release and you don't have to worry about either the focus or the exposure. And once again, I'll come back to these things in the realm of computational photography and computational cameras in a bit.
The one last thing I want to touch on is the concept of color in digital cameras. And most digital cameras have what's called a Bayer filter. And it looks kind of like this. So adjoining, uh, adjacent pixels have different colored filters placed on top of them. And usually there are two green filters for every red and blue filter. And what this gives them, uh, the, so the image you get is this interspersed uh, blue channel, red channel, and the green channel on the same sensor. And then they use demosaicing or interpolation techniques in order to recover a high resolution image in color. There are other sensors such as the Foveon sensor which does this, uh, this binning in depth rather than spatially. So uh, for each pixel they get a red, green, and blue uh, color value. Uh, one more thing over here I wanted to say is that this the elect electromagnetic spectrum that uh, ranges from radio waves to gamma rays, it's only a very small portion that we are interested in for photography. It's usually from 400 to 700 nanometers. And uh, this region gets actually split up into these three channels, the three color channels that you have, red, green, and blue. But this, the only reason you have these three channels is because of the human eye, which also has a similar three channels. And cameras try to mimic the, uh, the functioning of the human eye in that sense. But uh, if, you, if you look at multispectral cameras, and I think we'll come back to that in some other class, they, you can have a whole number of channels between the 300, 400 and 700 nanometer range. So this is the CIE chromaticity diagram. This is uh, how the human eye visually uh, in, interprets color. So what you have, it's, it's on an X, Y scale, and uh, it's what you have on the edges over here are the pure colors, or the color primaries, co colors that correspond to pure wavelengths going from 380 or 400 to 700 nanometers. And so a anything off that lies outside here is pure color, just a single wavelength. That's what a laser or some LEDs would give you. Anything within this is uh, a mixture of various colors. And the interesting property of this sort of color space is that if you have any two points on this color space and you mix those two colors in various proportions, you're going to get a color which lies on the line that connects those two points perceptually. And so if you have, if you have a triangle like this, which is a color space, the sRGB color space in this case, which is what most monitors and uh, LCDs use, you would get, if you have color primaries that are at the three vertices and you mix those color primaries in various proportions, you're going to get the color within that triangle. And uh, by simply varying the weight of the three primaries between zero and one, you can go from completely white, which is in the center, to one of the three colors. And that's what the color response, the, the curve for just the red, green, and blue color primary looks like for film and for a typical digital sensor. What's interesting to note is that even though we've advanced quite a bit from film to digital, the basic technique still remains the same. We still have the same three color primaries. They look almost identical. There's very little difference between them. And that's one of the goals of computational photography is to do away with the film uh, with, with the baggage that we still have associated with with film. And uh, part of this lecture is actually going to go in the other direction and say, how can we improve on that? So the rest of the class is going to be more about how can we get away from film, uh, whereas this class is more on how can we improve on film. Uh, in the graphs that you have shown, it looks like the film uh, has the colors more orthogonal being sensed rather than the digital sensor, right? Like yeah. you see the blue is leaking into the green yeah. and the red is leaking, but there it seems it's orthogonal in some sense, like it, it very less leakage. Yeah. Is it in general true or? I, I'm not sure in this case why it's like that. And also note that this is just one film which is optimized for certain kinds of photography. I think Velvia is supposed to be very good for landscape photography and sunsets and those kind of things. And that's something that you could do with film. You could have film that's suited for a particular task and different has different primaries. Whereas for 
cameras, it has to be, for digital sensors, it has to be something that's, that works across the board for different kinds of scenes and, uh, and things like that. So that could be the reason why it's like that. In the previous slide, the bear filter had two green cubes, uh, two green squares and only one for red and blue. Yeah. So is that because eye is more sensitive towards the greener channel? Yes. It's because when, uh, I think that's roughly the proportion of the cones in our eye also. And uh, green, if, if you look at the YUV, the illuminance, chromaticity relationship between RGB and that, green is the one that has the most correspond, most weight. Yeah. Okay, and then on the other slide, you showed a film that, I mean, then you mentioned that film can be more specific towards one sort of photography, the other sort of photography, the sensor and digital cameras. It, would, would it make sense or would it be possible to actually have different kinds of sensors that would be specific for different kinds of photography in digital? Uh, it's hard for you to change sensors once you have a sensor and it's baked in, right? I mean, the... Uh, yeah, I mean, if we could change the sensor... Of it, like yes, yes, and some of the stuff that I guess at some point we'll talk about in this course is there has been work on how to make more uh, flexible digital sensors, not just digital sensors, but making how do you make the whole camera more flexible so you can uh, programmatically change those responses and uh, you could do something of that sort. But. It turns out that for most photography, it doesn't matter that much. And just by using, doing things in Photoshop, if you have enough bit depth over there, it doesn't matter too much. But it does matter for things like remote sensing, where you need, even between 400 and 700, there'll be 30 or 40, they're divided into 30 or 40 different channels, which are almost completely orthogonal. And also going back to what you were saying, if you look at the response curve of the human eye, even that has a huge overlap. So it's actually quite similar to this one. It's not a partner. Any other questions? So that was sort of a very quick uh, overview of what I thought would be useful for you to know about film photography in general. And what I'm going to talk about during this class is what's epsilon photography. and. Uh, this is a coin that uh, this is a term that uh, Ramesh coined some time back, and the idea here is uh, the goal of epsilon photography is to improve on film-based photography, not to try and do something new, but just how to do what we could already do with film but do it better. And the way it's done in almost all cases is by taking multiple pictures or capturing more data. So you capture multiple photos, each with slightly different camera parameters. And usually the parameters that you vary are the exposure settings, the color settings, the spectrum settings, the focus settings, the camera position, the direction in which it's looking, or even the scene illumination. So you change one of these settings and you capture a whole number of images and then you somehow use an algorithm to combine those images together and you get one image that looks better than any one of those individual images. That's basically what epsilon photography is. And there are a number of ways in which you can do this epsilon photography, and I'm going to go through each one of these uh, one by one. Uh, you could do, you could take multiple pictures over time. You could take one, you can take one picture, save it, take a second picture, save it, take ten different pictures, and then combine them together somehow. Or you could do it over sensors. You could have ten different cameras co-located at the same point and take one image, one picture with each camera at the same time. Or you could do epsilon over pixels, and that's I'll get back to that in a minute. Or you could do a combination of all of these. So epsilon over time is something which is sort of the most common and it's what most photography manuals refer to as bracketing. And the idea of bracketing is a little different because in the end you end up using just one image. So when you're not sure of what the exposure should be or when you're not sure of where you should focus, you take multiple images with slightly different exposures or slightly different focus settings or aperture settings. And most cameras have inbuilt features for doing this. So you just you have to press the shutter bu uh, button once and it takes five images for you. And then when you go home, you can decide which one is the best and just use that. But in, so epsilon in time is similar. You take multiple images, but then you use some algorithm or some in something smart to combine those images together and get one resulting image. So the case where it's the most commonly used is for high dynamic range photography and I believe Ramesh talked about this in last class slide. He mentioned it. Uh, 
So, uh, as I was saying earlier that you need to have the correct exposure in order to get the image of a scene. Uh, even, it turns out that for many scenes, even if you have the correct exposure, you cannot capture everything that the scene contains. Your scene can have very bright parts, such as daylight, and very dark shadow regions, and the contrast ratio of these two can be as high as 10 to 8. And most cameras would not capture anything more than a ratio of about, a, excuse me, about a thousand. So one way of going around this limitation is to capture a number of images, and then use an algorithm to combine all those images together and create what's called a high dynamic range image. And I'm sure we've all heard of this term. If you just go on Flickr and search for high dynamic range images, you will get millions of pictures that people have captured using this technique, just capturing a bunch of images and putting them together. And there's been lots of research into how you should put these images together. And uh, it turns out that once you've done all of this, there's a related dual problem, which is how do you display that image? And I'll get back to that in a minute. But one way of displaying that is what's called tone mapping. And there is work on sophisticated algorithms on how do you compress a 12-bit or a 14-bit image back to an 8-bit image. And, uh, and there's, there's interesting work in that area which we are not going to cover in this class. Another example of epsilon over time is this this example that I really like. This is, I think, I'm not sure, but it's it's one of the first color images, or one of it's from the set of one of the first color photographs produced, and it was by this guy's name I cannot pronounce, but he went around Russia in the, the early 20th century uh, during. Uh, uh, I, I forget, but, but during uh, the early, early 20th century, and he took a whole bunch of photos of people just uh, living their lives, just going and farming, hunting, and just sitting, uh, and things like that. And then the way he took these pictures was he would take three images, with one with a red filter placed in front of the camera, then one with a green, and one with a blue filter. And then the, once he had processed his images and so on, he developed a projector which would project a red image, a green image, and a blue image, on the same same um, screen. So when you were viewing it, you would view a color image. And recently, as recently as about 10 years ago, till about 10 years ago, there was just these films that were lying in the Library of Congress, which were then digitized and hand-aligned, and then now you can download all of these color images from, from their website. So this is the very simple case of Epsilon in time. You just take three images with three different filters in front of your camera. Another example which is actually used, it's probably used in this projector, is that there's uh, most DLP projectors have a color wheel which spins in front of the uh, of the DMD mirror. And a part of this, it's a little hard to see, but I think this is red, green, blue, and then it's green again. And I think this part is just white uh, in order to increase the intensity of the of the or maybe this is red and this is just transparent. But when you have the red part of the wheel in front of the DMD, you project the red image. Then when you have the green part in front, you project the green image, and so on. So that when you actually view the projected image, and this happens really, really fast, that the eye integrates over time and it actually gives you the full color image. And one way to see this happening is if you take a camera and you just, just capture an image with a really fast shutter speed of about 1 over 1,000, you can actually sometimes get half the screen green, half the screen is blue, or you can get really interesting and weird artifacts if you try to do that. Now this won't work if you have an LCD projector because an LCD projector actually uses a color LCD and, and it's, you get all the colors at the same time. It's actually spatially, uh, in, 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 it's a spatial sort of uh, multiplexing instead of a temporal thing like this. So this was uh, doing epsilon over time. The next one is doing epsilon over sensors. And this usually means two things. You can either have multiple cameras, or you can just have multiple sensors within the same camera. And multiple sensors within the same camera is what's popularly called as a C three CCD imaging system. It's what's used in most high-end video cameras and camcorders. And you have this uh, trichroic lens with a uh, prism, which actually uh, Depending on the index of refraction, the rays get either either they just pass through or they have total internal reflection. 
and uh, so the red, green, and blue images are formed on three different sensors, which are exactly the same optical distance away from the scene. And so when you take all of those three images, I think that image over there shows you have white light coming in from the uh, from behind the prism, and then you have the green, blue, and red components getting separated uh, as they go through. And so at the same time, using three different sensors, and you can capture the three color channels. So it's similar to the th putting the three filters in front of the camera, but it happens at the same time. So you can use this for moving objects and so on. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, also uh, the sensor itself is in the, it usually has a very broad spectral response, so it actually responds to any incoming wavelength between 400 and 700 nanometers. It's only the prism that does the separation. So, why is this being used? Uh, why is that not being used in digital SLRs? It's just big and yeah. clumsy. I mean, the I, I think the question I would ask is the opposite. Why don't they use bare sensors in in uh, camcorders? And I'm not entirely sure why. I think this, this this might be something that's just stuck around since the first camcorders were developed and it was probably before their patterns filters became popular. There are fine, there are advantages uh, regarding heads. You can have sharper heads with this two cameras because because of the interpolation yeah. that happens with right. you so, have, uh, so probably those edges edge effects show up more in our video camera than they do in digital, just still photography. I, I'm, I'm not really sure why they're still used. I, I mean, they're definitely better. They do give uh, higher resolution as, as was pointed out. So recently, uh, uh, Morgan McGuire and others at Mitsubishi Research, which is just across the street, they came up with this really they took this to the extreme and it's, they said instead of just having three of them, why don't we have eight of them and make a whole tree of these kind of multiple optically co-located cameras. And so they came up with the very interesting beam splitter arrangement and all of each of these eight cameras are actually optically co-located at the same point. And so the image formed on each of them, if there was nothing else changed, would be exactly the same. But what this gives you uh, the flexibility to do is now each of these eight can have a different focus settings, for example. They can focus on a different plane. Or they can have a different color filter in front of it, and you can get eight different spectrum, uh, spectrum uh, channels at the same time. And what I think on the right it shows is just that he's shown, uh, he shines a laser through the cameras to align them to see that that ray of light actually goes into each one of those cameras. So. He used this setup for, or a simplified setup for doing matting or defocus matting in where he used, uh, I think, two or three cameras to focus on the plane and one that's focused in the background in order to do a separation between what's in the front and what's in the background. But uh, it, it, it's certainly something that can be used for various other things. It's basically the same concept of multiplexing over sensors. Another way you can do this is simply by using camera arrays. And uh, this was work, I believe, one of the first camera arrays, and it was done at CSA. And uh, it's epsilon. The, the difference between camera arrays and a SAMP or 3CCD is that this imposes a certain epsilon on your setup, that there's always going to be epsilon in the camera position. You can put other epsilons on top of it. You can have a different filter in front of these cameras, or you can have a different focus setting on each of these cameras. But just by itself, it gives you uh, an epsilon in the camera position. So each of the cameras in this camera array is actually, they're not co-located. They're slightly translated from one another. And that itself can be used to give interesting things, like I'll get back to that in a, uh, later in the talk. But this is another way of doing uh, this kind of uh, epsilon. And uh, Sanford has their own version of camera arrays. And now, actually, you can just buy a camera array, which is a 5x5 five five profusion camera. We have one upstairs, which it's one unit, and it actually has a very well-aligned and precisely calibrated camera uh, uh, array of cameras. 
The last one is epsilon over pixels, where different pixels are actually capturing different information. And we already talked about this one, which is uh, bare, the bare filter is essentially doing this. Uh, each pixel has a different color filter in front of it. And Rourke is going to talk about another technique a little later today, which is a very clever way of extending this and allowing you to do various other things without having to place the filters on the pixel itself, but <coughs> put them elsewhere, which is easier to do. So going back to whose question was it? Someone asked, can you change the shape of the filters uh, of, of the color response? I think you wanted to know. But Rourke will show you a way of doing that by simply putting something in front of the lens. And then you can have Epsilon in multiple axes. So this is a very cute camera that uh, also we have upstairs. It, it's got four lenses, and so it forms four images on the, on the film. It's a film camera. And it also has four flashes. The reason it has four flashes is not because of four different flashes, but because it can stroke them very quickly, one after the other. And so, for, so it opens one lens at a time, and when that lens is open, it strokes one of the flashes. So you get four images which are from slightly different viewpoints and taken at slightly different time instances. And there's a whole website full of creative stuff that people have done with these kind of cameras. But this is uh, Epsilon in time and also in uh, in the position of the camera. So in sensors. Yeah. So uh, is this on like film? Or this is on film, okay. yeah. And so does it give you four pictures on the film, or are they superimposed? They're not superimposed, they're four distinct yeah. pictures. Right. So this is work done by Srinayar some time back, which is sort of, it brings it all together in one nice package where you can do all of these things together. And it's what's called, what they call generalized mosaicing. Yeah. Are people aware of what mosaicing or how you capture a panorama? You basically, if I wanted to capture a panorama of this whole scene, I would take an image here, I would move, take an image here, move, take an image here, and take an image here, and then just stitch them together to create a mosaic which has everything in here. So what they came up with is instead of taking an image, each image with the same setting, they put, a, so that's the camera, they put a filter in front of the camera, some distance between the scene and the camera itself. And this can be a filter which either has a ramp in a neutral density gradient or different spectrums, different colors, or polarization, or even focus. And you simply, instead of taking one image at a time, you take a video as it's rotating. And from this, from the data that you capture, you can get either a high dynamic range of the whole scene or a multispectral image of the whole scene or a, an image that's focused at different points. So the way to think of this is that when you're taking an image here, different scene points, uh, like something over there is good, I'm going to get the blue channel of the pixel here. But when I rotate it, I'm going to get the green channel of the same pixel. I rotate it some more, I'm going to get the red channel of that pixel. So you just do this complete panoramic motion. You'll have some missing data from for the edges, but for anything in between, you'll be able to recover the complete information of this. But that's why they call it generalized, generalized because you could use it for any one of these things. And I think they also built a camera prototype like that, which was more uh, portable, and they just put this filter in front of the lens. So we sort of already discussed this one, which is doing HDR uh, capture by multiple images. You just take a whole bunch of images, and you can combine all that information together. And this is doing HDR over time. So the So that, that was this one. So I just wanted to take the example of high dynamic range imaging and see how we can do this over time, over sensor, and over pixel. So this is the first one, which is doing HDR over time. This is the second one, which is the uh, generalized mosaicing, which is sort of in between the three uh, settings, and in that you just put this filter in front of your camera, and you rotate the camera, and take a video. This is using multiple detectors. This is similar to the SAMP or the three CCD setup that we saw. You have multiple cameras that are optically co-located that take multiple that take images at the same time with different filters in front of them so they have different exposure settings on each one of them and as you can see each of these areas has had lots of work done in them the last one is this uh, 
using this what's called a sorted pixel. I think that that's a more generalized version of the other two hundred that we. Yeah, so it's similar to the pair mosaic, but instead of having just a RGB pair mosaic, they actually had two or three different levels of uh, neutral density filters also placed over each pixel. So each pixel, this blue is different from that blue in the amount of light that it captures. And so you can do an interpolation in the color, but, and you can also do interpolation in intensity in order to get a high resolution image. And this is essentially what, this is what they call it assorted pixel, but it's more like generalized Bayer pattern, Bayer filtering. Uh, and you can put uh, polarization filters also on top of it, and uh, or you could have other colors other than just RGB. And again, Rohit is going to talk more about this later. And this was actually work done at Columbia in uh, collaboration with Sony, and Sony actually made a camera that did this. Uh, it was only a prototype, it was never sold, but they were able to get this uh, picture from an assorted camera, assorted pixels camera, which has a much higher dynamic range and captures all three color channels at the same time. This is another example of uh, doing this over time. Uh, this high dynamic range capture and the way this was done is that you place an LCD in front of the sensor which is of a much lower resolution than the sensor itself. You capture information on the sensor and you, you see certain pixels go get saturated, they're too bright and in the next time step you actually put uh, a darker patch over those pixels so that you compensate for the brightness uh, and uh, use Going through iterating through this, you can get an image which is which is which has a lower dynamic range on the sensor. But once you combine that with the information that you pumped into the LCD, you can then recover a high dynamic range image. The reason I wanted to just mention that is for this one, where this is actually a work done by Wolfgang Heydrich, who gave a talk in our group sometime back at University of British Columbia in Canada. And this is stuff that's been bought over by Dolby and you, they're actually using this stuff in Samsung LCDs now. But this is a way of generating a, a high dynamic range display. And the setup is very similar, uh, is very similar to the previous one and it's actually very simple in that instead of just using a projector and projecting on, on the screen, which is what a rear projector display does, they have a a projector and then they have an LCD in front of it. So they have two layers of control and they get twice or uh, the squared of uh, what they had earlier as much control over the dynamic range of this of what they can display. And so they can control the, I think this is a very early prototype uh, over here. So they had two layers of uh, LCDs. So one inside the projector itself and one placed over there. But you can also just do it with uh, two layers of actual physical LCDs. And it turns out that the LCD at the back has to be, can be of a much lower resolution than the LCD in the front. And you can just, using that, you can get very high dynamic range. And I think most HDTVs and so on also, they have this thing where they can dim the backlight, so they get this very high uh, dynamic contrast, which is sort of confusing, but it's essentially not just modulating the LCD, but also modulating the backlight. That's essentially what this is doing, but not just the whole backlight. Backlight is modulated differently in different parts of the screen. Yeah? Well, how come you can use a lower resolution for the, for the front LCD? No, not for the front, for the back LCD. For the front, you, you still need full, full resolution. Because the back LCD is essentially acting like a backlight. And I think they also had like a diffuser here, which anyways reduces the resolution of the back LCD. Otherwise, you might get weird edges and so on. So uh, that was a little about high dynamic range. The next thing I wanted to talk about is what we discussed earlier, this concept of focus setting and how we can extend the depth of field. Now, there are many applications where you want a very large depth of field, like I said, for example, landscape photography, you want the tree next to you and the mountain far away to be in focus. But as we discussed, in order to do that, you need to stop down the lens or you need to have a very small aperture, which means you are going to get very little light coming into the camera and so your noise goes up or you might have, have things move while you're taking your exposure. So a number of techniques have been proposed 
over the past 30, 40 years, especially in the area of microscopy, in how can we extend the depth of field while still keeping the aperture size reasonably large. And there is recent work done in the area of light field cameras, and one I didn't write over here is wavefront coding, which I'm sure Ramesh will come back to later, which also allows you to extend the depth of field uh, while still having a large aperture. So the first technique that's the most interesting one here is what's called focal stacks. And the idea is very simple. It's basically epsilon over time again. And you take multiple images focused at different planes. So for example, you have this uh, ant sitting under a microscope or this. Uh, you, when you focus in the foreground, you get things in the foreground are in focus, but it's uh, hind legs and the rest of the body is out of focus. If you focus in the background, you get focus. Uh, you, you, the, the foreground is not in focus. So what they instead did was they took a whole series of images, and I'm going to just flip through them, that are focused at different planes. So I think that's about 10 or 12 images that you can capture all of those. And you can do this because the object or the scene in this case is static just over time. Or you could use the SAMP kind of setup where you capture all these images at the same time, but each camera is focused at a different plane. And then you combine all of this information together in order to create one image that's uh, completely all in focus. And uh, so Asim Agarwala from uh, University of Washington proposed this very interesting and clever technique of how you can combine them together of finding out regions in... So each image has certain parts that are in focus. So you do a contrast-based uh, estimation of what parts are in focus and that's what's shown on the right. And then you do a gradient domain sort of merging of various parts together so the end result doesn't have any weird discontinuities and it looks nice and smooth and everything is in focus. And I think Ramesh is at some other point we will talk about uh, this, this technique itself in more detail. But what I wanted to mention is more the focal stacks. You can just take a whole bunch of images, focus at different planes, and then you can put them all together in order to get one all-in-focus image. Was the analysis done in uh, computer vision, or did it use auto, uh, like <coughs> already data that was coming from the camera when, when the actual picture was taken? Uh, you mean this data? No, how the way to combine the images. So the, the combining the images was actually a different technique. It's this gradi gradient-based uh, merging technique where you have Im stuff from one image and you have stuff from another image that you want to put together. But if you just cut that image and put it here, you're going to get weird discontinuities and colors are going to be different. But it turns out if you do that in the gradient domain and then do a Poisson solver to integrate the image back, you are going to get a nice smooth image and all the error is going to get distributed as noise throughout the image. So that was what the, the technique initially proposed and they just used that technique for, um, for, for this focal stacks in order to get this. I think the example, I'm sure Ramesh is going to talk about this at some point. The example they had in the paper was that you have a scene like this, and if you take a picture from here, you might get someone not looking at the camera or someone caught yawning or someone is just has a bad, bad face. If you take 10 such images, each one of those images is going to have some people who are okay and some people who don't look okay. But there's not going to be one single image that has everyone looking at the camera. So. They, they developed this technique in order to combine all of those images together to get one image that has everyone looking at the camera the way you want it to be and still look like a picture that came from the camera. And uh, I should have put that in somewhere, but it's, it's called uh, digital photo mosaicing, I think. And uh, it's, uh, it's a graph of four. Yeah, photo montage, digital photo montage. So you can do a similar thing with a light field camera. I don't know if Ramesh has introduced the concept of light fields yet. Has he? Yes. Yes? No introduction. So a light field basically captures all the information coming into a camera. And the way it's traditionally usually done is by putting a micro lens array in front of the camera sensor. If you don't understand that, that's fine. I'm sure he'll go into more detail. But what this, what you can get from the light field is you can extract the focal stack out of the light field and then do basically what we did in the previous case and extend the depth of the field if you want. So a light field essentially what's important to know, remember is the light field can be used to extract the focal stack. Uh, 
if needed. So that's another way of extending the depth of field. There, there was another paper recently which again I did not put over here, just which is interesting because the, so it, it, it was from Sam Hasinov at CSAIL where he instead of taking one image with one aperture setting, he he claims that if you take multiple images with two or three different aperture settings and then you combine them, you are going to get much, your total exposure time is going to be much shorter and you're going to get less noise and so on. So that's yet another way of combining. It's similar to focal stacks, it's just doing focal stacks more smartly because focal stacks focuses at each plane and what he said is that you can find an optimal set of planes that you need to focus in order to get the best results. So that was extending the depth of field. There, the opposite problem is how do you make the depth of field shallower? And this is something that comes naturally when you use an SLR camera with a large aperture lens. You have a very shallow depth of field if you open the aperture all the way out. And so your main object is in sharp focus, but the background is nice and blurred. But if you use a small point and shoot camera, it's very hard to get that kind of an effect. Uh, since your aperture size on the camera is usually very small. And so the question is, how can you still use a small aperture camera and get results like the one at the top? So there's been a couple of three or four papers in this area that try to attempt to solve this problem. The first one is, again, from CSER by Fred Durant and his student. And what they did was you start with an input image, and then from just one single image, they estimate the depth of each point. So, sorry, before I go into that, the reason why this is a hard problem is because firstly, just from this image, it's hard to estimate what's in focus and what's not just by looking at the contrast. And even if you can get that, even if you know that the foreground is in focus and the background is out of focus, if you have multiple layers in the background, each one of those layers are going to be out of focus, more or less out of focus depending on the depth or the distance from the plane of focus. So it's hard to estimate the 3D shape or the 3D structure of this from just a single image. It's much easier to do it from two images, but what this paper, Defocus Magnification, did was they tried to estimate the 3D structure of the scene from just one image and then use that one, that 3D structure and the, scene, the image that was captured in order to increase the defocus by simply applying a spatially varying blur filter on the image. So, you can see the background is more out of focus than in the image that they took over here. And this is not really epsilon photography. I just put this here because it falls into the overall structure. But this is more of an image processing technique than anything else. Another way of doing this is what's called synthetic aperture photography. And this is something that was uh, proposed by Mark Lavoie's group at Stanford, but it's something that's more general and it's been used in red arts and so on for a long time. The idea is actually really simple, that what you want to do is you want to simulate a large aperture lens such as the one shown here. However, you don't have the physical resources to create a large aperture lens, but what you can do is create a number of small aperture lenses and then somehow take the information coming from each of those lenses and computationally combine them in order to simulate a large aperture lens. And it's essentially what, one way of thinking of this is from a light field camera kind of uh, point of view, but another, or just a camera array. But if you just think of it simply, you can combine each of these rays coming together into the lens if you can find out what those rays are and get what you would have gotten from just this one large lens. And now if you, look at a different point in space, you combine a different set of rays and you get the intensity corresponding to that point. So, it's essentially doing this, uh, uh, what, what gets done with a large aperture lens in optics, you're doing that computationally by combining all these rays. So this is what their setup looked like. And uh, this is one of their setups. I think they had five or six different uh, different optical configurations, but this one allows them to see, so they use this in order to focus on something that was behind a bush. So 
Yeah, so that's that's what you would get with just one image. And what's on the right if the video plays is Okay, that's weird. But anyway, so you can simply by computationally combining the rays, and you'll actually learn how to do this kind of computation. I think it's in one of your assignments also. Uh, it's probably the next assignment where you combine information from multiple cameras and you, by s simply shifting and adding, you can focus on a different plane. Okay, so maybe I don't have a video for this. It's just you can focus behind on a different plane and anything in front goes out of focus. And since your depth of field is so shallow because you have this large synth synthetic aperture, everything over here actually goes out of focus and it just blurs out and you can see behind the foliage in this case. Do you know, do you know if the, um, the bushes are moving in time? Is that I don't think it matters because it takes just one image from each camera. It's, it's a camera array, so it's not over time, it's over sensors. And that's a good point. You could you could actually do this by taking a camera and moving it around and taking multiple images, which is exactly what the next paper does. Uh, this is actually a work by Professor Shinsako Hyura, who was a visiting professor in our group last year, and his students in Japan. And they generalized this thing to, instead of having a fixed, rigid uh, camera array, you can just take a camera and move it around and take multiple images. And then using, com using computer vision techniques to line up various scene components, they are able to get results kind of like that. So this is just with, I think, three or four images that he took just by moving a camera and just taking random images without any structure or any sort of calibration or anything. And from that, he's able to focus now. In this case, the focus is on the foreground and the background is defocused. And in that case, focus on the background and the clock in the front is out of focus. So this is also, it's similar to the camera array thing, except you don't need a camera array. You can just take one camera and over time you can move it. So in this case, if the scene was changing, you would have problems reconstructing it. Uh, finally, the last technique I want to talk about is something that I worked on last year and really quickly try to go through this. I think I might have put too many slides in for this. But the idea over here is to do it more optically rather than computationally. And it's the basic idea is that instead of keeping the camera and lens static while you're taking an image, uh, you intentionally move the camera, lens, and sensor, and it's what we call image destabilization. You move the lens and the uh, sensor synchronously with one another during the exposure. And so to give you an intuition for how or why this works, so once again, going back to the image we had in the beginning, if you have a plane in focus that's plane A, all the rays coming from a point on plane uh, from the point A get focused on A prime, and the rays coming from B get focused on a point which is a little in front of the sensor, and so you get this defocused blur on the sensor. And the size of this blur depends on the size of the lens aperture. If you reduce the size of the aperture, it, it goes down. Until you have a, if you have a pinhole, then you just get one ray going through, which is what we saw in the beginning. So now, if you take up the pinhole and you translate the pinhole over time, then you're going to get a blur over here, which corresponds to the motion of this pinhole uh, coming from the point B, and similarly point, from point A. Now, what's interesting is if you if you compare these two, they're not the same size. They're actually, they have a different size. And the size ratio actually depends on the distance between A and B and the distance between the points and the pinhole and the sensor. So what, what we do instead is we, while we're moving the pinhole, we also move the sensor. But we move the sensor such that the ratio, such that one of the points actually remains fixed on the sensor. And the other point produces a blur. So now we've taken. I haven't shown the actual motion, but through this sequence of images, point A was always focused on the same point on the sensor, and point B was focused on a different point. And so point B results in this blur, which point A does not. And you can use this, <coughs> this, this sort of a setup where you have the lens and the camera in two different planes, and the camera is moving at a different 
velocity than the lens and by the ratio of the velocities you can focus at a different plane in front of the camera. So this is an image you would get with just a small aperture lens, uh, I think f22 or something, where everything is in focus. And this is the image you get using our technique where just the thing in between, this is still the same lens, uh, you, you get something which is in the focus in the middle and everything in front and behind goes more and more out of focus by simply translating the camera lens and the sensor over the exposure time. And so the advantage of this is that you can simulate a large aperture lens or an SLR lens using a small camera lens so you can you don't have to spend uh, most many of those lenses cost more than thousand dollars so you can use a twenty dollar lens in order to create a similar effect as that produced by a thousand dollar lens but the disadvantage is that you need this motion and so you need some space around the lens where it can it can uh, translate which is not all that hard because if you look at the space around the lens most of it is wasted and not really used Okay, at this point, maybe it might be a good idea to just switch to Rourke and see what his technique lets us do. Uh, I have a couple of other things here, but I think we can do that after his stuff. But I don't know, do you want to break for five, ten minutes first? Yeah. Sure. sure, so we can break for five minutes and at so 2.45 we can continue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to go back to the sure. bio path and you can say if you you can fly. I mean, it's not as good as, as the TCCD. Yeah, because uh, there is something that's called crosstalk, and there's optical crosstalk and electrical crosstalk, meaning you end up having those fuses side by side, and you can have some photons that actually pass, say, one fuse, but end up counting as another one. Do you want to draw that? In? I mean, if you go back to the to the bad path, and bad, then, then you can actually. I, I think what you're sort of saying is if you have a sensor here with these two pixels, and then you have say red and green, and then the the photon can actually cross, say, yeah, exactly this, and it's going to come the other way. And also, um, there is the fact that, uh, I mean, photons are different wavelengths and have different energy. So it, it might be that one will cross its Jupiter. But we'll sort of uh, walk a little bit and actually end up counting to another one. So right. this is another kind of crosstalk. And uh, if you would you like, I mean, yet another reason for that. I mean, uh, the I mean, refraction varies with wavelength. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you have a single plane here, you're going to have uh, photons with different wavelengths focusing different points. So this is, this is what calls chromatic. chromatic yeah. So you have to add extra objects in order to compensate for that. Right. But, uh, but uh, you know, people you know, know how to do the objects, but I think that in the sharp edge are the major reasons why for, you know, high-end applications like medical applications, people go for the CCC. Right, of course, yeah. So, and also for the Fovion sensor has similar advantages in some of the cases. And, uh, I mean, uh, of course, using a 3 CCD sensor or multiple distinct sensors is always going to give you better results than the bare filter. It's going to be more expensive, perhaps. But I think the question that uh, you had was, why is it that we use 3 CCD for video but not for still? Uh, why does it matter more for video? And I'm not entirely sure of just get more light. That's one. You need more light for video in general. Otherwise, and okay, the filter functions by blocking light. No, but then the even CCD actually splits up the light, so you use that's all the light. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So you get three times as much light or something. 